um, <laughs> David David Webb uh, has asked us a question, and he says, in order to avoid chemical additions. All right, so he's taking us. We're not there, we're not there yet, David, but I'm going to put the question out there. What about filtration after cold crashing to stabilize? So we're going to get to cold. We're going to get to cold crashing, David. Don't worry, but uh, that's a good question. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, we did talk about cold crashing a little bit, but he's right. Um, you could filter after cold crashing, or you could filter without cold crashing. Um, if you've got uh, enough spare cash to buy yourself a, a reasonable enologic filter, uh, you can pass your mead through a filter element whose openings are so small that yeast cells will not pass. So effectively, you get clear mead coming out of one end, and all the yeasties get trapped on the other end. Uh, and, and, and that's certainly a, a, a third alternative. I generally don't suggest that for people who are home mead makers, because most of the filters that actually work <laughs> are rather expensive. Um, there are some out there that, you know, the, that, that claim to work that are a little cheaper, and you know that use similar filter media to the more expensive varieties, but I've not used one personally, but I've heard of other people who have, and for reasons unknown, they pass enough unfiltered mead that you still end up with problems. So uh, again, you can you can use filtration either by itself, standalone, uh, and and. If you do choose to filter, it's uh, a very good idea to wait as long as you can to allow your mead to naturally clarify and allow those uh, heavier suspended particles, yeast cells and other things, to settle out before you start to pass it through a filter because filter media have a limited life. They will get clogged if they filter enough particles, yeast cells or whatever, uh, and so it, it's always better to start with relatively clear product before you pass it through the filter. Makes sense. Or it'll get clogged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, David, or it gets David, clogged up oops. quickly. David yeah. has a follow-on question. He says, what about the 0.5 micron plate filters that are available through homebrew supplies? They're about like, they're like 60 bucks. Yeah. Those are the ones that work for most people most of the time. Those are the ones that I've heard some somewhat sad failure stories about them. <laughs> ah, so, okay. uh, you know, you, 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 you take your chances and cross your fingers and hope that it works. Uh, half a micron is generally small enough that you'll only get yeast cell fragments. Um, you can get newly budded yeast cells. That's sort of like right on the threshold because they're like at seven-tenths of a micron generally. But uh, eh, you, you got to trust your filter media then, and you have to trust your process. You have to have put the plates together exactly correctly, and you have to make sure that there are no leak arounds. And, eh, yeah, you can do it if you're careful and if you've got the, the right media. And uh, that's probably irrespective of the price of the unit, but, you know, the ones that cost more generally go together easier and work better. You get what you pay for. Sounds yeah, like it. that's it. David's, okay. David's got more questions. He's still typing, but get, keep going. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's he's, okay. he's he's on oh. he's on uh, Skype and he's just he's just wrapping out the questions here. So. <laughs> and you know, if you're if you're all about being absolutely certain that things are as stable as possible, you can always multi-step your physical stabilization process. Nobody says that you only have to cold crash through one cycle. Nobody says you only filter through a particular grade of media only once. You certainly can do multiple passes uh, in order to try to clear up any residual uncertainty. The problem is, uh, you know, you reach a point of diminishing returns, and with every handling step, you expose your mead to more free oxygen from the air. So, you uh, you, you, you kind of have to 
do it enough that you're reasonably well convinced you've done it as well as necessary. Um, and unless, again, you've got the ability to get a sample of your mead under a microscope and do a cell count or a cell inspection, you're never 100% sure with the physical uh, stabilization processes that you've completely solved the potential problem. Now that said, um, many of my meads, because I enjoy making dry meads more than, than, than sweets, um, I don't even bother with SO2. I just do a couple of stages of, of, of racking and clarification, and that generally takes a few months. I'm, I'm patient. Uh, and then I bottle, and everything is fine. Vicky, how do you, or do you? <laughs> um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm just getting ready to make a bunch more meads. And my, and my processes are probably going to change a little bit because since I made my last meads, I've learned things. I always learn things. But I honestly, I would, uh, you know, I would, I would set it up to go to where I wanted it to go. And when it got there, I'd rack that puppy and then rack that puppy again. I never use filters. Um, and I would just keep racking it until it was as clear as I could get it. Now, granted, you know, yeast are microscopic, so it's not to say that there isn't any in, um, you know, in suspension. But I've had relatively few bottle bombs, uh, you know, after, after doing that. I never sulfided, um, never, never stabilized really in any way after, like, the first couple batches. First couple, I followed the wine rules, you know, Campton tablets and stable, you know, SO2 and, and the whole nine yards. But... Um, once I started, uh, getting heavily into mead making exclusively and sort of abandoned the wine sites, I just, uh, I just let it finish, you know? And, uh, I, I had, I think two batches that have gone south on me, you know? And when they did, they were spectacular, but, you know, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I came home once to like, you know, the, the, uh, raspberry it was the raspberry mead it's always the raspberry mead looks like uh, <laughs> csi needs to be in my basement because there was this pool of what looked like blood all over my basement <laughs> and my daughter found it oh and, like, the, and the splatter on the ceiling yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> well, yeah i've had that too and you open them you know it's like boosh half the bottle's gone you know just like that yep. yeah but uh no you're you're kind of reinforcing what i was saying vicky if you're if you're patient enough yeah. and you rack enough times uh you're you're generally safe and the reason that you're safe is that, you know, those, those few remaining cells, even if they're actively fermenting, uh, generally the, 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 the fermentation rate and then the amount of evolved CO2, the, the carbon dioxide that the yeast throw off as part of the metabolic process, uh, diminishes. And in part, the yeast stay in suspension because they are in a relatively high gravity or dense liquid medium at first. And they're making CO2, which tends to stick as micro bubbles on the yeast cells themselves. That's and so the yeast basically ride the bubble up into uh, or, or, you know, up more toward the top of the uh, fermentation tank. And... Uh, Stay in suspension, get exposed to more sugars, um, get exposed to less uh, of the toxins that they would see if they were down toward the bottom of the fermenter, and so they'll stay active longer. Now, when you've taken away most of the fermentable sugar, when you've got a relatively high concentration of ethanol in, in the resulting mead, uh, it's less dense that means those yeast cells, relatively speaking, are now denser than what they were floating in before as, as you've gone from a, a pure water and sugar-based liquid to a, an ethanol water mix. And they tend to fall out of uh, suspension more quickly. They don't make as much CO2, and they are heavier than the resulting ethanol water mix that they're in. And so even if they're still fermenting, they fall to the bottom. Yeah. where they then run out of sugar because they're in close proximity with each other and they eff effectively starve themselves to death. 
So it's kind of like that end. It's kind of like that end scene in the Battle of the Bastards. Then you know they're, they're just crowding them up against the wall of bodies and they're going to die. You know, no, no yeah, pretty much. There, yeah. You know? <laughs> okay, yeah. I was gonna yeah. link it to watching your JAO's progress if you put it in something clear where you can watch it. And you, oh, okay. you can see the you can see fruit bits and and raisins riding up and down in with the CO two, and then as that starts to die down, things start to settle out. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's a really good example. And in fact, you know, if you if you read enough of of the Got Meat archive, you'll see that some of us did some experimentation with adding bentonite, which is. Yeah. Uh, I've used that a few uh, times. Uh, yeah, it's 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 essentially a clay, mm-hmm. but it absorbs water and then, you know, increases surface area and provides lovely little nucleation sites for micro bubbles of CO2 to form, and then the yeast kind of get pushed up on these little bits of bentonite that are holding those CO2 bubbles that the yeast are creating, and they kind of ride the elevator up to the top of the must and then drop back down again. Um, it makes for a more efficient fermentation in a completely clear must, and now we're kind of getting away from stabilization, but that's yeah. another little sidebar discussion that's you know, of interest to, to mead makers. So if you're working with a, 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 a pure traditional and it's a very light-colored honey uh, and, and, and your, your must looks clear or nearly clear before you start fermentation, you can improve fermentation kinetics by adding a little bit of bentonite to the, to the tank before you, you pitch your yeast. Oh, I never thought about putting it in at the beginning. That's an interesting possibility. I'll have to try that. Well, I, I thought about it because it's one of the things wine kits always have you do is add the bentonite up front. Oh, okay. See, now yeah, I never did yeah. try that. I've used it at the end to, you know, to help, you know, clear things. So um, we do have mm-hmm. a comment from Paul Johnson. And um, Paul said uh, he had, a, and this is uh, harking back to the filter conversation a little bit. Uh, he said he had a, um, was it Buono? Uh, wine filter. Vin Bono. Bono, yeah, Vin Bono. Yeah, I've got number, one of those too. Yeah, used the number three pad and it restarted fermentation and then he comments, nothing's a guarantee. So he's right, you know, I mean, mm. you mm. can think you've done everything right and used all the tools and um, they're stubborn little buggers, you know, I mean, they... They got a will to live. Uh, True. Yeah, I guess so, True. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, which which raises the whole question of do yeast have souls? <gasps> Who knows? God, I hope not. <laughs> I know. Right? We're all going to hell. Uh, I, 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 I honestly <laughs> think they are, they, are, they, are, they are getting the best possible life experience. <laughs> True. <laughs> well, you got to figure that's what they live for, to eat sugar. So if you give them the full eat sugar experience, then in the end, they've lived a full life and it's time for them to go. <laughs> eat sugar till you die. That's what right. a life. Right, yeah, what, what a life. I mean, who wouldn't want that, right? Um yeah, ask me that after this weekend. <laughs> Paul's, Paul's got a little side conversation going on with me about how appropriate it was. Of um, And, you know, spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. If you have not watched the current episode of uh, Game of Thrones, you need to stop up your ears for a second. And how appropriate the ending of the Battle of the Bastards was, uh, you know, with Ramsey. So, just saying. <laughs> but, yeah. Sorry, okay. yeah, sidebar. We have, no, we have no way of signaling them to let them know that they can listen again. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Uh, unstop your yeah. ears now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that's interesting with the bentonite at the beginning. <clears throat> I'll, have to, uh, mm. I'll have to fuss around with that. I'm fixing to pitch a couple of uh, bombs because uh, Bray was kind enough to put together a couple of recipes for me. So now I'm, like, intrigued. So okay, yeah, yeah. That might be something I play. I'll pu- I'll put that on my to brew list, and I might get to it in the next decade. <laughs> <sighs> Sometime after you start your meadery, you'll be like, oh yeah, right. Jesus. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now the way when I tend to what I tend to do is if it's um if it's gone completely dry and you know I'm pretty sure it's out of sugar and there was no more wiggle room left for the yeast, I won't bother stabilizing it unless there's something weird going on with the batch or um, unless I used a, a fruit that I know it has more of a tendency to oxidation than just mead will. Um, and, um, however, even with residual sugar, a lot of the time I won't stabilize, but that's because I'm a lazy ass and I leave my stuff in the carboy for a year, two years, three years. 
And I figure if it hasn't, you know, with the temperature changes, you know, even in my basement, I still get significant temperature changes between winter and summer. And, um, you know, even so, 